Okay, great. So I want to start a um, little bit of a cop-out, but for those of you who might get bored with my talk, and it's completely different from the ideas that Dan presented, so you couldn't have two more different talks about the state of the planet or where we're heading. Um, my own talk is about conservation, and it's about how to make conservation the really green inside of the environmental movement, how to make that sustainable. I work for the Nature Conservancy, the lead scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Our mission is to protect plants, animals, natural communities that represent the diversity of life on Earth. And for a long time, my organization, and along with lots of other organizations, some of whom are in the room here today, have worried that we're really ultimately not succeeding in our mission. Because when we go outside, we don't see the world changing in such a way um, for the better, if you are into thinking about nature and wildlife. And so I want to come at it from a very different angle and sort of give you a sense of where we're heading um, and where conservation is heading for the 21st century. And the short answer is, if it's going to succeed, it has to be sustainable for the people who, who live there. So I'll start this with like a two-minute video, which is basically my talk. Um, so you can just watch the video and leave. Uh, or you can watch the video and it could intrigue you to stay and hear the stories in more detail. So if the video will work, let's try it. We haven't actually tried it yet. Earth. For centuries, we have transformed our planet in the hopes of improving it for ourselves and for our children. But now, our children face a future without the very things that sustain us all. Today, we face a world that challenges us to take a fresh look at what we value and how we act. From the deserts of Namibia to the valleys of Montana, from Virginia's eastern shore to Brazil's Atlantic rainforest, we must care for the places that nurture us, the places we call home. We have the choice the knowledge and ingenuity. We only need the will. For this extraordinary planet and all the life it holds, the clock is ticking. It's not too late for the diversity of life and our diverse ways of life. We can make a difference. Great. Thank you. So um, this picture is taken in Namibia, and it shows um, some rock art, or what you would recognize as rock art. And it's in a valley near the Brandenburg Mountains. Um, and you can see this sort of art all over the world, wherever people have lived. If you have ever been to Australia, you would have seen art that looks like this. The Australian indigenous people, the Aboriginal people there, call it song lines. And song lines are a way in which indigenous communities would represent the physical world, but also the spiritual world. The two would combine together to create a map, if you will, of their environment, of their habitat that they lived in. Humans would be placed within it, and the symbols would mean all sorts of things depending on context and who is singing the song. So you can sing a song line, but you can also represent it this way. Circles, for example, are often representative of water sources, but that's not always the case. Song lines are directional, so they have a certain way in which you can read them. You can't read them in reverse. Um, and so this is the way in which Aboriginal people would interpret um, nature, if you will. One of our project directors, the guy who runs our Australian program, and it's an Australian guy by the name of Michael Looker, told me the story about how he went to Arnhem Land, which is in sort of north central Australia. And he sat down there with indigenous leaders, and they said, well, what have you come here for? And he said, well, I've come here to do a habitat assessment. And they kind of looked at him in puzzle and said, well, why do you want to do that? We, we already have ours. And it was on the wall. 
And that is what they've been doing all their lives. They've been doing what we scientists or ecologists would call habitat assessments. And it's up on the wall. It's their way of interpreting nature. Now, songlines are 40,000 years old. They're still done today, but they can be traced back maybe even further than that. Today, we've sort of moved away from that. And when I was a graduate student going to school, I went to school at UC Santa Cruz. Um, you know, and I, I sort of grew up in that community of conservation biologists who are greatly influenced by this new resurgence of a movement called the conservation movement. You know, conservation biology as a field was being formed at that time. And the one person above all who perhaps influenced our field greatly um, was, was this guy, E.O. Wilson. Um, and, yeah, I hear the yay for E.O. Wilson. And you're absolutely right, yay for E.O. Wilson. E.O. Wilson, personal hero of mine, he's an incredibly generous human being, a lovely person, an unbelievably knowledgeable biologist, sociologist, um, and so on and so forth. And no doubt he had a huge impact on our development as conservation biologists. And we who then got into these positions in organizations like the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund and Conservation International and in the federal government, state government, and so on and so forth, and are laying out our own song line now that we hope the world would follow in terms of being able to implement conservation. But I think you, Wilson, to be careful saying this, because I don't want it to sound as if I'm slagging him, because I'm not. I'm hugely respectful of what he did and who he is. I think your Wilson unknowingly misguided us. And here's why. So when this book came out, I mean, I remember when this book came out, eagerly went and got I bet you some of you have this book, one of these books in your, in your, in your library. I mean, look at the covers of these books. He introduced us to this word biodiversity, forest dripping with life. You know, the, the notion that humans were just one in a million species, one in 10 million species, maybe one in 30 million species on Earth. We just won. But really, the diversity of life is magnificent. It's out there. And it's that magnificence of life, almost cathedral-like in his descriptions, that compelled us to then go out and preserve it. And these covers really basically tell that story. I mean, look how pretty, pretty they are. Look at that water drop. And you see an orangutan in there and a toucan. And then there's you know, rabbits in there. There's a whale in this droplet here and sea anemone. But there's one thing missing from both these covers. Exactly. Humans. Right? So we're entirely missing from these covers, these sentinel books that really launched a generation of conservationists. It is as if you know, he's painted utopia without us, yet we are by far the biggest agent of change and preservation and modification of biodiversity. All right. Um, and, and I think that that launched a whole series of strategies of conservation that have only been partially successful. They certainly haven't been successful once the money dries out. And that's the key thing. Once the money dries out, what happens? What happens to projects in the Gabon or in the Amazon or in Indonesia once the money runs out? And more often than not, and my background is from there, I mean, I've, I've lived abroad and lived in all those countries, you know, when the money runs out, they tend to crumble. That's really not very sustainable, right? So then you start asking, well, how else can you, what other kind of model can you put out there? So what I'm going to do is tell you four mini-stories from places that I've been literally in the last year or two um, that, will, uh, that can be told in different ways. As a conservationist, I'm telling you a conservation story. But if you had a local person tell you that story, and I hope one day you will, either because you go there or one of those people come here, the first story would be a story of economic well-being in a country with 80% unemployment rate. The second story would be a story of sovereignty in the only country in Asia that has had a successful succession movement that spawned a brand new country in the last 20 years. The third story would be a story of security in a country ripe for Al-Qaeda operatives to move in. And the fourth story is a story of healthcare in a country where half the young male adult population is HIV positive. Those aren't conservation stories. I could tell you those stories in a healthcare seminar, in a security seminar, in an economic development seminar, um, or in a you know, uh, national, na uh, national movement sovereignty seminar. But I'm going to tell you the condensed version, again, very condensed version, um, from a conservation perspective. All right. First story, we go to the Solomon Islands. Right? If you haven't, how many of you have been to the Solomon Islands? Anyone here been? 
It's always good to know this because then you know how much, right, very, how much divergence you can take with your stories, right? But the Solomons are a really amazing place. Um, there are about a thousand islands spread, and feel free to interrupt and correct me, spread over two million square kilometers of ocean. They're a really cool group of islands. The language diversity there is unbelievable. There's over 110 languages in the Solomons, and there's only 500,000 people. You just do the math there, and you'll see how diverse they are. The last, the headhunters of, of, of Asia was found in the Solomons probably into the 1940s. It's the first place that American forces um, encountered Japanese forces on land. Guadalcanal Diary, you know, that famous World War II battle was held in, in the Solomons. Um, and it's where President Kennedy swam to shore. There's actually a swim in the Solomons called the Kennedy Mile. You can do it, but you have to do it very fast. There are lots of sharks in the water. Um, it's also the last place that the Japanese surrendered to the U.S. in the sense that there was one Japanese soldier who held out to 1967, hiding in a cave in the Solomons. Um, his, he had to have letters dropped from a plane by, written by his mother to convince him that the war was over. And then the official delegation came and decommissioned him. I digress. It's a place that you can get lost in. And what makes the Solomons so amazing is um, it's marine diversity. Right? It's in the heart of the coral triangle. That's a pygmy seahorse. It is about the size of my, my little uh, fingernail. My little fingernail. Now, when you go to the Solomons, you ask a simple question. How many people, uh, what's the unemployment rate here? And you hear this number, 80%. And it's staggering. Because you think, well, with 80% unemployment rate, this place should look a lot different. Um, and I'm going to go into one little piece of the Solomons. And I'm going to talk about one place called the Anravans. The Anravans are a group of three islands between two much bigger islands. Uh, a big island called Choisel and another one called Santa Isabel. And they're like that, and the Anravans are stuck right in the middle of it. That's a giant clam, by the way. Very few places you can still see giant clams in the Pacific. In the Anravans, you can still see giant clams that are giant. The Anravans had a lot of conflict. For decades, people were fighting one another because they were, um, they were trying to make a living. So it's 80% unemployment. People aren't starving because they're making a living from the ocean. Right? That's where they get all their materials from. The money that they, small amounts of money they need for the cash economy, but more importantly, food, materials, medicines, everything else really harvested from the ocean. There's a lot of conflict in that region. And um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how, but basically one great leader who was in the Anaravans uh, created a peace pact between three warring communities that eventually got them to the point where, with the help of the Nature Conservancy, with the help of the Solomon Island government, they created a detente around this one area that they were fighting for. And they were fighting for this region because of economic needs. And they created a marine protected area in this region. It's about 110 square kilometers of marine protected area. It's set aside. It's called taboo. The taboo word, by the way, is a, is a word that comes from the sound. They spell it T-A-M-B-U there, but it's a, it's a native word. And taboo means stay away. They're not allowed to go in there. They self-govern it, self-police it. But because that area is set aside, there's an enormous amount of fish spawning activity that happens within that region that then creates benefits outside of that marine protected area. And so you, we have found, we've sent sociologists to these villages around the Anaravans, and we've found that over a five-year period, their income level has doubled. And this is using five different indices of measure, um, including cash um, and, and things like, you know, um, how many kids go to school, and so on and so forth. And the reason it's doubled is because they're actually getting more benefits by leaving this one area aside, basically as a nursery for fish, for troca shells, for things that are very, very high value, but are completely depleted anywhere else in the South Pacific. Um, this girl, for example, has three sea cucumbers in this boat. Those three sea cucumbers are exactly equivalent to what it would take to send her to school for a, a semester. Um, that's all she would need. And... Um, so it's a really pretty neat place to visit because you, number one, see enormous amounts of fish life and sea turtles and giant clams and things like that. But you also see communities that are thriving compared to the rest of the South Pacific. And it's because they have come to a collective agreement that says that we can manage the commons collectively better. Um, economically are better off, but as a result, conservation is also better off. The second story I'll tell you is in Indonesia, in the Wahia province of, uh, sorry, in Indonesia, in Borneo. Um, now, Indonesia has lots of tropical rainforests, and a lot of it is under assault from oil palm plantations. Um, oil palm plantations 
Well, palm oil is found in lots and lots of things that you use, from chocolate chip cookies to soap that you use. So it's a common ingredient. And the prevalence of this has taken over lots of Indonesian lowland forests. It also creates a lot of other problems, such as releasing peat from the soil, which could, um, or drying out the peat, which could create greenhouse gas and so on and so forth. But just the oil palm plantations alone just spread almost like wildfire through the forests of Borneo. So I was, I was there early last year, and long story short, I stumbled into one little forest, about a 70,000 acre forest, called the Wahia Forest. And in a sea of oil palm plantations, all of a sudden you come upon this forest, and it's a pretty intact forest. There's big trees there, there are birds like this pitta bird that you won't see very many other places are still found there. You see lots of orangutans and orangutan nests there. It all intents and purposes looks very intact. And if you get to the edge of the forest, you start seeing totem poles like this. They're really tall. They're um, you know, close to the size of the ceiling here. And they're you know, sort of fierce warriors with animal heads um, sort of on the corners of this forest. And I sort of ask this question, so what are these totem poles? Why are they here? And so on and so forth. And you start working the story backwards. And it turns out that this forest is an indigenous forest protected by the Wahia people, a, a Dayak tribe of Indonesia. So, you know, my question immediately was, well, why have they protected this forest when everything else around here is just completely gone? Um, and to just give this, give, put this in perspective, let me tell you how hard it was to get there. So I, I live in Montana, so I had to fly, you know, obviously get to Jakarta. And from Jakarta, I had to take a small plane that, you know, it's a jet that flew for like three hours to Balikpapan, which is in, you know, on Borneo. And then I had to take a smaller plane that belongs to actually a mining company that would then take me like two hours by propeller plane to this other little town. Then I had to get in a car, uh, a, a, a Land Rover type of vehicle, and then drive for eight hours um, until I got there. It's very remote. And all through that, you're going through this blithe landscape, this sort of morass of burnt out forests, oil plant plantations, some agriculture, and that sort of thing. So it's quite remarkable when you come into it. I said, I've got to meet this, these, this community. I said, all right, we can introduce you to the chief. I said, great, let's go see the chief. So to go to see the chief, you've got to backtrack. You've got to get out of the forest, get back in your vehicle, actually drive for half a day, which is about 50 miles. Not, the roads are really bad. Go about 50 miles, and you come and you meet this chief, and his name is Chief Tak, T-A-Q. Um, that's, that's his name. So there's Chief Tuck and myself, and this guy who works for the Nature Conservancy, Eric Myhard, who's one of our biologists in, in Indonesia, who's translating for me. And, you know, he invites us into his house, and he lives in a village. And, um, as I said, about 50 miles outside the forest. And I talked to him about the forest and all this, and what it was like when he was a kid. And, you know, he tells me all these great stories. And he clearly loves the forest. He clearly bemoans the fact that his kids are not growing up there, and that it's an important place, and he loved life in there. And I had to ask him this most obvious question, well, if you love it so much, why do you live in this not-so-nice village? Um, I didn't say it quite that way. I said, well, why do you live here? Why don't you live in the forest? And he was puzzled by this question. And I had to repeat it again, and Eric translated it to me, and he said, no, I've always lived here. The forest has moved. And that's when it struck me that, you know, his village has always been on the bank of this river. And it's just that in his, you know, 20-year reign, he's seen the forest just go back, 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 back. Now, and now it's in the farthest reaches of his kingdom, quote-unquote. And so then I said, why are you protecting? And he said, do, do you want to do some ecotourism there? Are you going to build a little lodge? Do you guys use it for hunting, maybe? And he said, no, we don't do anything with it. I said, no hunting? No, we don't let our young people hunt. Maybe one day, but not now. Medicinal plants? No, not really. We don't collect anything there anymore. We don't want anyone going in there. What about ecotourism? We could put a little bed and breakfast there. I'm thinking, you know, bird watchers are going to come. You could bring some TNC people there. No, no, not really interested. We just want to leave it alone. This is really unusual, right? Why do you want to leave it alone? He says to me, well, when that forest goes, the we're here are no longer people. We're just a Dayak tribe. We're just another Indonesian. There's nothing that will distinguish us from the rest of this country. This giant country with a very unique sense of nationality. As long as the Wahia forest is there, we are a people. We have a link and we can make demands. We can make um, demands to government. The government respects us. So for them, it's all about sovereignty. It is so integral to who they are as a people that as a chief, he is willing to set aside 70,000 hectares of land rather than plow it under or cultivate or put into oil palm plantations. And, you know, he sort of says, so, yeah, we've done it in everywhere else, and it hasn't got us that much. So if we do this last bit, you know, that'll go as well. So that's Chiftak and his 
notion of sovereignty and what it means to, to do that. I know it sounds really very touchy and nice, but this is an absolute true story, and he related this to me less than a year ago. And just by the way, about a week after I left, he was awarded the highest environmental prize that Indonesia could give. So they flew him to Jakarta, the first time he had ever flown a plane. He met the president, the newly elected president of Indonesia, who then presented him with this, this award. Very, very unusual for Indonesia to recognize, you know, sort of an indigenous community who's asserting their claim on land. Third story is in northern Kenya, and I was just here about a week ago. Um, so northern Kenya, basically, when you say northern Kenya, you start Mount Kenya, you go all the way up to the Somali border. And the landscape very rapidly looks like this. It looks like a desert, which it is. It's a very se semi-arid landscape. It's vast, it's big, very few people. And the people who live there are mostly nomadic communities. Uh, Borana, Somali, um, Sumburu, Renteli. And they are cattle herders. They live and die with cattle. And they move through the landscape and so on and so forth. And they go through this every year, go through the cycle of drought, famine, then good years, then drought, famine, good years. And the cattle numbers go up and down, up and down, up and down. It's a huge amount of social um, conflict that is created by the instability of rainfall in a landscape like this. So years like last year, when they had a huge drought, they lost tens and tens of thousands of cattle. And when they lose the cattle, lots of conflict starts. Everyone tries to sell the cattle at the same time. Prices are depressed, of course. And then when they want to build their stock back up, what do they do? They go and raid from another tribe. Right, the Samburu, I had a great Samburu guide who told me that they don't steal cattle. Um, they just take it because this, all the cattle on the earth belong to the Samburu. And the way they do it, it's, it's actually brilliant. It's really, really good. His, his, and this is, was his philosophy, and it's a great philosophy. He said, what we do is we go and take the cattle, and then we drive them into a broad valley. And we put the cattle there for everyone to see. And then we stand there. And if anyone else wants to come and take it from us, they're welcome to come and take it from us, Right? If they don't show up, then it's ours. If they show up and fight, fine, they fight. But they are open about it. We don't steal them. We just take them and then say, here they are. <laughs> it's true. I, I kid you not, he told me this. So, so you know, there, there's a lot of conflict in this region because of cattle and because of the instability of rainfall patterns and the depressed poverty that everyone lives in. Um, everyone tries to sell the cattle, as I said, when prices are, are the lowest to do it so. So what happens when this happens is that no one wants to go up there. Northern Kenya is sort of a no-go zone for tourists. Lots of wildlife, lots of great stuff to see, but all the game lodges, all the good stuff is in the south, right? Up there, it's kind of a little dangerous to go up there. And there's no infrastructure, no one's willing to put any investment and so on and so forth. And so what happens? What happens is it becomes a major infiltration point for both poachers, but also much worse than that, people who have really bad ideas about the government of Kenya or the United States and so on and so forth coming down from Somalia. So that's the route that is taken, right? So if you want to get into Tanzania, you want to go into, into uh, Nairobi, you want to go into Arusha, you're going to come through Somalia and you're going to come down that route. And you're going to come down that route because no one's watching that landscape. It's too big, it's too vast, it's too easy to hide, and it's too much instability in that region. So some years ago, some conservationists working with USAID and others started putting into place, by the way, there are lots of, when you go up there, you'll see a lot of British uh, soldiers running around the countryside. You'll also see special forces people who you think are special forces people just by the way they are dressed. They don't look like tourists. Um, you know, they have binoculars just like bird watchers, but they have big cases with them. And so there is a lot of surveillance going on there, but you can, when you see how big the country is, you quickly realize that that's not really going to work. You just won't find the people there. The best eyes on the land are the local people. The best eyes and ears on the land are the local communities. They know when anything moves. They know. They know that land too well. They're there all the time. So a few, starting a few years ago, some conservationists started bringing into this notion of creating grass banks, basically telling local communities, we will set aside this area for wildlife, We'll set up a little lodge, a really small lodge, um, very high-end, bring some revenue in, but significant revenue. A, a little lodge, um, this is some of the security forces that these guys um, are operating up there, but like this little lodge here, you can just see the, the little pool there and the elephant. It's uh, got about 12 beds, and it generates to this community about $60,000 a year, which is pretty significant. The lodge and all the infrastructure, the tent, the camp, 
uh, the little airstrip, is all actually owned by the community. The management is not local management. The management is brought in from outside because they have the connection with the tourists and so forth. It's very low impact on the landscape, very high end, but it puts money back in. So they said, look, we'll set aside areas like this area that you see here. That's the Matthews Range. This area is no grazing here, no cattle in that region, that, that area here. It's a grass bank for all intents and purposes. Wildlife flock to that area. Tourists come in, little bits of money come in. There's more stability in the region. In bad years, it's opened up. And the community can come in and graze their cattle and thus avoid this feast and famine cycle. In addition to that, there's also programs trying to reduce the overall number of cattle and increase the quality of the cattle, create a marketplace for these cattle to be exported, so on and so forth. But that's long term down the plan. Right now, what they do have are these small community enterprises that are bringing in more people in and bringing in a little bit more stability to the region. And because of that, the conflict really has dropped down. In the last couple of years, there's been very little open armed conflict going on in that region. And when you go into the communities and you talk to the communities that are working on this, you really get the sense that they are better off because of the conservation activities that are in the region. They don't really see it as conservation. They see it as grass banking for their cattle. They see it as a hedge. Um, and they see it as a way of getting tours. In. And they also see it as stability. They don't want armed people going through their land either. And the last story I'm going to tell you is a story that's still, on, it's still being revealed. But it's such a good story that I really want to tell you this because it really changed the way we think about conservation in a lot of ways. So Malawi is one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world, Lake Malawi. Um, Livingston um, spent a lot of time in, in, in this, in this, on this lake. And scientists know it because it has an unbelievable diversity of freshwater fish, especially a group of fish called the cichlids. There's over 800 species of um, freshwater fish in Lake Malawi. That rivals that rivals the fish that you see in the South Pacific, for example. In the Caribbean, there's only about 300 species of fish, just to give you a sense of one freshwater lake with that level of fish diversity. Now, all that's good and fine, but Malawi is also a country that has a huge health problem. And one of the big problems that they have is HIV. Now, Malawi, like lots of, like some African countries, have had a pretty um, effective program, in some ways, of dealing with HIV. They work with the UN, they work with lots of agencies, um, lots of foundations, to put in comprehensive programs that tries to get a handle on the spread and transmission of AIDS. And it's been working. And if you look at the numbers in sub-Saharan Africa, in countries like Zambia and Malawi, um, the numbers are looking better all the time, except in one region of Lake Malawi, and that is of, of, of Malawi, and that is the region along the lake shore. Along the lake shore, in particular parts of the lake shore, you find out that no matter what they do, HIV rates keep climbing up, 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 up. And this puzzles them because HIV. Um, uh, doctors who work on this really have this down to a science. They know how much antiretroviral drugs, how much education, how much condoms, how much all the stuff they need to put together to get what kind of outcome. And they find that over here it doesn't work. No matter what they do, the rates keep climbing up. And this puzzled them for a long time. They're thinking, why is this happening? Well, it turned out that they started looking a little broad and said, what else is going on around here? And it turns out that there's another thing that is spreading along Lake Malawi, and that is a disease called Bellasia. Schistosomiasis. About 300 million people around the planet are, are susceptible to it. It's basically a little fluke that lives in the water. It lives actually in a snail. It's a host. And the fluke comes out when you're wading in, in stagnant, muddy water. And it gets into your skin. And then it makes its way and lodges itself in a vein between your stomach and your liver. And then a male and a female fluke mate, and they produce millions and millions of eggs that start clogging up your internal organs. And as a symptom, you don't necessarily die, you can live with it. As a symptom, you start peeing blood. So there's blood in your urine. Now, it turns out, once you introduce blood into your urine, your, all your models for how HIV is transmitted under normal heterosexual conditions goes out the window. Basically, you have to saran wrap people in order to keep this from spreading. You can see why you, know, you introduce a little bit of blood and the whole, the rates change completely. So the doctor said, well, that's why HIV is such a hard thing to handle on the lake show. It's possibly because there's Bellasia, and Bellasia is going up, introducing blood, which is making our models basically not work like they're supposed to, given how much input we're putting in, in terms of prevention. So I said, well, why is just the going up so much? Well, it turns out that it's possibly going up because the snail population in the lake has exploded. All right, why is the snake population, why is the snail population exploding in the lake? Well, it's probably exploding because people have caught a lot of big fish. 
And there's not enough big fish now to basically eat the snails. So you've had this huge decline in fisheries. And we know fisheries numbers since the days of David Livingston. We've tracked fisheries numbers on Lake Malawi. So you've got good records of how much catch has come in. Today's catch is about 30% of what was brought in during Livingston's time, just to give you an idea of how much it's collapsed, particularly some kinds of fish. Also, the water has become much more turbid because agricultural runoff comes in and makes the water a lot more turbid, creating better conditions for the snail to hide in. So the doctors start talking to the ecologists, and it basically comes together as a story that says, if you really want to deal with the health issue, you have to also deal with the lake issue. So for a doctor, this is a health story. And for a conservationist, it's a conservation story. So that's the last story I wanted to sort of tell you. Four different ways in which conservation um, can be thought of as sustainable because it is meaningful to the lives of real people who live there. One is a health story. Another one is a security story. Another one is a sovereignty story. And the last one is an economic well-being story, probably the most common of the, of the four types. And that's not true just in places like that. It's also true in the landscape I live in. I live in Missoula, Montana. And the crown of the continent region of Montana is by, you know, by many measures one of the real unique western landscapes out there. It's the only landscape in the low 48 that if Lewis and Clark were to come back today and walk across the country, they would find all the plants and animals they saw on their original voyage of discovery. There's a reason why um, Jared Diamond starts his book Collapse, 60 pages of it, based in that, that region. And it is a landscape that is struggling with this issue. What does conservation mean? How important is the landscape to us and our community that lives there? Are we going to separate that landscape from our well-being, or are we going to integrate it within our well-being? Are we protecting nature um, from people, or are we protecting nature for people? And it's an active dialogue that happens there in my community that I live in. And I suspect in many, many communities around the West as well. So, so to close this up, you know, when you think about um, our generation, you know, we're a really unique generation. We're really the first generation that can see the entire planet. And when we are to think about, you know, our own song lines, you know, we're thinking about our song lines really on a planetary scale. Um, and not just in terms of our little communities. You know, we're thinking about what kind of song line we're going to put out in terms of the entire planet. I think that we are an incredibly lucky generation. We're the first generation that can really, um, you know, 40 years ago, we really wouldn't know what we know today. We wouldn't be able to think about issues like climate change and what to do about it. We just wouldn't have the knowledge to do that. And 40 years from now, a really good chance that it will be too late to make any action. So we're on that cusp. We're on the right place at the right time. You know, those who will see the worst but have the opportunity to really do the most. So as we think about what kind of song lines we want to create on a planetary scale, not just our community, not just our state, not just our region, but also the entire planet, um, I think that what we really want to do is envision nature in such a way that humans are part of it, not apart from it. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a little line that was in my invitation letter to, to this talk, and it was a quote from Stegner, and he basically talked about his aspiration, um, and his aspiration was to create a society that can match our scenery. And it seems to me that if we want to really do that, then we need to include society and its needs very much into that scenery. That's it. Thank you.